Hey, Kermit Weeks here, Fantasy of Flight, and we decided to do a voiceover on a previous Wildcat uh, Kermit cam that we did, but unfortunately when we first started working on it, we realized the cockpit was way too dark, the camera angle was way too high, so we decided to give you a little bit of a cockpit check before we started. So here's the left side of the cockpit, and generally when I do a, a, any kind of a checklist or a cockpit check in the airplane, I always do a left to right sweep. And so over here we're starting out with the, uh, the fuel. We've got, currently it's in the off position. We've got a selection for the main tank, which is what we're flying with uh, today. And then there's a left and a right droppable tank, which uh, we have the shackles for and the plumbing, but we don't actually have the tanks installed. Next here is the flap control, and they're either up or they're down. And on a Wildcat, it's interesting. It has a vacuum system that operates the flaps. It doesn't operate uh, under positive pressure like a hydraulic system. It operates under negative pressure. And one of the cool things about this is it gave the pilots the possibility that when they got in a dogfight with the Zero, they could just throw the flap handle down and above a certain speed the flaps would not come out. But if they got into a little bit of a dogfight, you know, tail chase and deal, as they slowed down the flaps would slowly start to come down and it would tighten up their turn radius. So here's the rudder trim and just forward of that is the aileron trim. Here we have the throttle, and there's a push to talk mic uh, switch on the top of that. So if I want to talk to somebody, I just use my thumb, and that's how I control the radio. Now this is the mixture control here, and right now it's in the idle cutoff position. When we go to start, we'll push it forward to the open rich position. And uh, for takeoff and climb and high power settings, we'll stay in full rich. Once we get up to a comfortable cruise speed, bring the throttle back. Uh, the mixture lever comes back to about a halfway point into a detent that what's called uh, auto lean and it maximizes the efficiency of the carburetor at that point. And down below that is the uh, the throttle friction. You can actually turn that clockwise and it increases the throttle friction. So after takeoff, uh, if you push the throttle up, if you have to like let go of the throttle to reach down and uh, you know do something else with your left hand, basically you can adjust the friction to where the throttle won't creep back. So we always adjust it to where uh, it's just kind of in a, it's movable, but it's in a point that if you let it go, it would uh, basically not not drift at all. Up here we've got the IFF lights and basically there's three switches. It stands for Identify Friendly or Foe. There's three different colored lights under the wing which you could turn on with those switches. And whatever the code of the day was, you would turn on a certain combination of lights. And then just behind that there's a Morse code uh, button there which you would tap out the Morse code of the day and hopefully your friends would identify you as a friend. And here we've got uh, kind of a map case here, and uh, normally I put my aircraft logbook in there. Just forward of that, you could see just barely there's a cylinder head temperature gauge. Here we've got the tail lock, unwheel lock uh, lever, and the tail wheel basically is free swivel. Currently it's in the unlock position, so if we were going to move it around uh, in the hangar, we'd leave it in the unlock position. The only time we have it in the lock position is we would line up on takeoff, we would uh, you know, line up the tail wheel to make sure it was straight, we'd put it in the lock position, wiggle our butt a little bit and make sure it locks, and we would take off uh, in that, and we'd also land in that. So the only time we basically leave, leave it unlocked is if we're taxiing or we're moving it around. Okay, back here we've got the elevator trim lever, and as you can see, if we roll it clockwise, it's uh, nose down, and if we roll it back, it's nose up. Here we've got the blower switch. Right now it's full forward in the low position. If we push that little button on the top and we pull it back to the high position, there's a micro switch down there that actually the handle depresses and electrically engages the, uh, the engine in the high blower. And basically, you would you would manually do that once you got the altitude. You started running out of uh, you know manifold pressure on your throttle. Uh, you would lower the throttle a little bit. You would shift into high blower. It would basically be going like from first to second gear on a car, and it would spin it faster. And it would take that thinner air at altitude, compress it more, and then it would maintain your power to a higher altitude. Okay, so here we've got the main panel and uh, everything up in front of us.
The first thing over here on the left is our mag switch. Currently it's in the off position. Then we would go to left mag. The next position would be right mag. And all the way over clockwise would be to both. So when we do the engine run up, we would uh, start the engine. We let it turn through uh, a couple of blades. We would go to both and start it. And uh, then when we did our uh, pre-takeoff engine run-up checklist, we would check both mags and look for a, a slight drop. You know, anywhere from like 50 to 75 is acceptable. If it bangs a little bit too much, then you need to, you need to look at the mags or clean the plugs. This here is the rheostat for adjusting the light intensity on the gun sight, which is in the upper top of the panel there. And down below there, there's a little switch that either turns it on and then there's a secondary light that you can actually go to an alternative light. So it's two lamps that do the same thing. It's just a backup. Down below here, we have an eight day clock. I think they basically call them an eight day clock because if you wind it up all the way, it lasts eight days. This here is a handle for the prop control. This has a Curtis electric prop on it. And in the full forward position, it would give you fine pitch for takeoff. And uh, to, to operate it kind of like a normal prop that would be a hydromatic, which would normally have been on the throttle quadrant by the throttle and the mixture control, when you pull this back, it will adjust the, uh, the RPM back on the governor to maintain the, the proper RPM that you set it at. And you can push it forward and pull it backward to do gross corrections. But once you kind of get it close, you can spin it to the left and decrease it slightly in a fine way, or you can screw it in clockwise a little bit and you can adjust it uh, to increase it. This here is actually the propeller control for the uh, Curtis Electric prop. There's a little circuit breaker on the left. And the switch there on the right there, basically in the position it's in now is in automatic. So whatever you set that propeller control to down to the lower left, the little black handle, once you set that, as you climb and dive, it'll maintain that RPM uh, through the governor by adjusting the pitch on the blades. If that switch goes down to the neutral position just below automatic, it actually then makes it a fixed pitch prop. The prop stays whatever position that's in. So if you dive, you're going to increase RPM. If you start to climb, you're going to decrease RPM. Now, if for some reason that went out or you wanted to the, the governor quit working or something, you can actually, if you go down and to the left with that switch, it'll decrease the RPM. And if you go back to neutral and then go down and to the right, it'll increase RPM. So if for some reason you didn't want the the brushes on a cross country, you know, always working on the Curtis Electric prop to save that. Once you got set up for cruise, you could actually flip that switch down into the off position, which would be this neutral position, and it would basically uh, be a fixed pitch prop. But if you didn't change your altitude or change the power settings, the RPM should stay the same. This here is just a fuel low warning light, and once you got down to a certain uh, uh, low setting, uh, that light would come on to give the pilot a, a warning. If for some reason the fuel gauge was broken or something, uh, or the pilot was distracted, uh, that would be of a help. Up here is the electrical boost pump, and anytime for takeoff or landing, we always have that on in case the engine driven pump, uh, which is your primary uh, fuel pump. In case that quit, this is a backup, so there's always fuel pressure to keep the engine running. And if for some reason, uh, like a lot of times when you're switching fuel tanks, if you run one dry, you would flip that boost pump on and, uh, you know, then you'd be swapping tanks and it would give you extra, you know, uh, encouragement that the uh, engine's going to start again once you got to the right tank. And just above that is basically a, a panel light. Uh, there's going to be a few of them around the cockpit. Okay, here is the uh, fuel gauge. Uh, this airplane uh, internally, uh, the fuel tank is forward of the cockpit there, holds 126 gallons. And the airplane burns about 50 gallons an hour, so you've got a couple hours flying plus a few gallons to, to get worried and look for a place to land. Of course, the airplane does have the ability to hang uh, drop tanks on the wing for longer cross countries. This is basically your uh, carb air control in the, uh, the big handle if it's push full forward is basically cold air. That's what we'd use for takeoff. And if you pull that out, if you got into icing conditions, uh, it would give you not only, uh, uh, you know, warm air uh, to melt that carburetor ice, but it also gives you filtered air as well. So if you were operating in a really dusty environment, you didn't want the dust going inside the engine, you could pull that out too, but you'd probably want to push it forward for takeoff. 
Okay, so here we've got the altimeter. And uh, actually, there's a little knob down there on the lower left that you can actually adjust to uh, either field elevation or the barometric pressure. Over on the right side there, kind of between the two and the three, there's a, a little window there that uh, shows barometric pressure. So if you were flying uh, you know, in the air and you were talking to a controller or something, you could find out what the uh, local uh, barometric pressure was, and then that would pretty much make your altimeter accurate. Um, or, you know, if you're taking off and you knew the field elevation at Fantasy Flight was a 144 feet, then uh, you would adjust it to 144 feet on takeoff. A lot of times when we used to do aerobatics and stuff, we used to zero the altimeter because I didn't really care how high I was above sea level. I really kind of want to know how high I was above the ground. Up here we've got our directional gyro. This here is our airspeed indicator. As you can see, the outside uh, gauge, uh, it's a Navy airplane, so it's in knots. And once it goes around all the way, to 60 knots, 80 knots, goes around 180, 200 knots, then we start reading off the inside gauge. This instrument in the middle is our turn and slip indicator, and uh, if we're making a right or a left turn, the little needle on the top will tell us uh, if we're turning right or left, we'd use that in instrument conditions, and if we were slipping or skidding a little bit, uh, not, uh, you know, centered on the rudders properly and everything, the ball would go to one side or the other. This is our rate of climb indicator indicated in uh, each number is a thousand feet per minute. This here is our uh, attitude indicator. Uh, right now the little knob it says to cage over on the right uh, lower side there. Uh, if we rotate that all the way it locks that. If we were going to do any aerobatics or anything like that we would always cage the artificial horizon. And once we kind of get in a level attitude and stuff we would lock that, make sure everything was adjusted and we would unlock it. Uh, at a level altitude and it would uh, you know be used for instrument conditions. And this little knob here is basically how you can cage and uncage the uh, the gyro. And here we've got our tachometer and as you can see the engine's not running right now and uh, our takeoff uh, RPM is basically uh, 2800 RPM is our red line on takeoff. Over here we've got our manifold pressure gauge and our ambient pressure right now is 30 inches of mercury. Uh, we would do our mag check at 30 inches. Once the engine starts, inside the engine there's always a negative crankcase pressure. And if the, with the throttle back at low RPM, that would drop down to about uh, uh, 15 inches. And when we go on takeoff, this engine has a supercharger and we would actually compress the air more than the ambient uh, air pressure that's available. And as you can see, we would take off at about 46 inches there. There's a the little white line on the gauge. And over here we've got the oxygen flow indicator, and as long as the oxygen is flowing, if you were at altitude, that would be blinking. If it quit blinking, then the pilot would quit blinking. Over here is a, an oil dilution switch, and electrically what happens is if you were operating in a, like a really cold environment like Alaska or something like that, a lot of times they would turn that on depending on what the temperature was going to be forecast and they would actually take oil or gasoline from the tank and basically mix it into your oil system to thin the oil out in the engine for starting uh, for the next start the next day. This is your 3-in-1 gauge and the top gauge there is basically your oil temperature down and to the left is your oil pressure and over down and to the right that's your fuel pressure and as long as you're flying you're pretty much looking for them in the green what happens is when I go to start the engine I'll let the engine warm up uh, pretty much till you get about 40 degrees before you go taxi or you do a run-up. Okay here we've got the uh, the cow flap handle which basically manually opens and closes the cow flaps you can see by the two little placards up there on the top if you rotate it clockwise it'll close them and if you rotate it counterclockwise, it opens them. You'll see me pointing to this and pointing to the cow flaps when I'm cranking it while we're flying. This little compass behind the stick there is called an RMI. It's a remote uh, magnetic indicator. Right now it's reading about 50 degrees uh, uh, where it's pointing. And then there's a little, the little parallel uh, deal there, which you can just kind of see behind the stick. If you wanted to hold a heading or something, you could spin it around to say, hey, you know, head 090. You would spin that around to 090, and then you would keep turning the airplane until the needle ended up in the middle of it. Yeah, down here we've got a little knob. If you pull it out, it'll uh, put hot air up uh, into the windscreen in case you're into some like uh, icing conditions or, you know, like in the morning when you get in your car and turn on the air conditioner, 
Although the Wildcat didn't have an air conditioner unless you open the window. It helps uh, you see out of the front windshield. Okay, so over here on the right side of the cockpit, we've got the voltmeter, and it basically tells you, uh, you know, what the battery voltage is. Obviously, the master switch is off now. If you turn this on, it should go up to the battery voltage, which would be 24 volts. When you're flying, actually, the generator is going to deliver, so that voltmeter would read about 28.5 volts to uh, let you know that the generator was working. And this is basically just a panel. You've got your master battery switch there. You've got your generator switch, pedo heat, and then there's a lot of the uh, turn on the lights on for the airplane. Up here, basically, you've got some rheostats to control the cockpit lighting. If you were flying at night, you know, you could actually adjust them to meet the, the intensity that you wanted for flying. Here we've got a master armament switch. The little electrical connection there, I'm not exactly sure that's behind it. It could be... Uh, for a, a heated suit or something like that, but we don't use it. Down here, we basically got uh, the gun master switch. Uh, you got two switches down there that basically you could either shoot the outboard guns, of which there's 250 calibers, and then the inboard guns, 250 calibers. So there's 450 caliber uh, machine guns on the deal. And then the switch in the back there is just basically the radio master switch. Here we've got the landing gear indicator for where the gear is in transit. Uh, right now, obviously, we're on the ground, and hopefully it's down and locked. There is a little locked indicator uh, that's forward of that. There's a little bent tab there that's got some red on the top that actually would uh, that pops out when it's down and locked. That's the last thing that comes out. So when you're cranking the gear down, you want to make sure that it goes down, and then you keep cranking. It goes a little bit harder. That little thing pops out, and it says down. And so that's what we're looking for when we before we land. This here is actually the landing gear handle and uh, in the back there there's basically a raised lower switch and it's kind of like a ratchet on a ratchet wrench and so what happens is uh, the gear is down right now so after takeoff what I would do the first thing I do is I'd push that little uh, lever forward to the raise position and then you would start cranking the gear clockwise there you know up and back and I believe from memory it's about 32 turns uh, to get the gear all the way up and locked and then you would reverse the process coming down you'd put the little ratchet uh, thing in the back there to lower you would crank it forward and uh, you know watch the gear indicator and then look for that down uh, tab to pop out there that's forward of the landing gear indicator right there. And down here, we've just basically got some uh, uh, some fuses down there that uh, for the electrical system, different things. Okay, so we're warming up the engine. First thing I'm checking, I'm looking for the oil temp. Remember, I'm looking for 40 degrees centigrade before we you know really run anything up. Just kind of checking all the switches and you know looking over fuses and stuff. See the gun side up there on the top of the panel. This is how you lock the uh, the thing. There's a couple little clips there right now. I've got it set for uh, takeoff, and I'll basically lock it there, you know, for a couple inches. It gives me a little bit of air flowing in the cockpit, and uh, you know, actually the Navy guys, obviously on a carrier, they would take off with it wide open in case they had to ditch or something that didn't, didn't, didn't go right on takeoff. Keep watching the temp. You've got the mixture forward. Checking the fuel. Just kind of scan and looking for everything. Before I take off, I, like I said, I do a left to right uh, thing. Here I am, I'm basically running up the engine. I've got 30 inches of manifold pressure and I'm checking the mags. Getting a little bit of RPM drop there, looking on the tack. Bringing the throttle back. Checking the uh, prop, coming back. So I pulled the, recycling the prop back. And remember, this is an electric prop, not a hydromatic. So the RPM is going back up, push it back in. Now I'm going to check the little uh, the switch over here. I bring it down, I drop it. So I went to low, flipped it back up, and I went back to automatic. And as you saw, it went back up to uh, where it was set, which is full RPM. Turn it on the boost pump. Just going through my left to right cockpit check, to make sure everything's done. And you see the cow flaps are open in the front there for takeoff. Checking the controls. We are lining up on my short runway at Fantasy of Flight, taking off to the northwest. And I just locked the tail wheel. So I got the tail wheel kind of locked up and went ahead and uh, pushed it in the lock position. 
This is a great flying airplane. Oh my God, this is a fun little airplane. There are like no red lines for G's or uh, speed on this airplane, none. Okay, push the little ratchet lever forward to raise, and then I'm cranking the gear up, 32 turns. And if you see the airplane, you know, kind of doing a wavy pattern on takeoff, you can see why. I'm flying with my left hand now, so that's the reason why we set the throttle friction, so it wouldn't drift back. So there we go, so I'm bringing the throttle back from the takeoff to a climb setting. Now I'm bringing the propeller back, and I'm bringing it back by pulling out the prop control. If I wanted to tweak that slightly, I could twist it in and out instead of pulling it. Climbing up, checking for all the temps. So I got the cow flaps open on the climb. We'll, we'll close those when we uh, when we kind of get leveled off, pick up a little bit of speed. Just basically adjusting the, the propeller control there. Probably setting up for cruise. So that's a set, got a set for cruise. Got the boost pump off. And I would look down and check for the fuel pressure. So now we're going to crank the uh, cowl flaps closed. So I'm manually closing it. Everything on this airplane is pretty much manual. You know, the cowl flaps, the landing gear. Like I said, the flaps are basically uh, vacuum driven. There's a big tank in the back of the airplane that holds negative pressure. There we go, where the fuel is still in the main tank, which is the only tank I've got. So I'm bringing the mixture control back to uh, auto lean. So the carburetor is uh, basically set up now for uh, the maximum uh, fuel efficiency for cruising. We use uh, full rich for takeoff and landing. Checking all my temps and my pressures. Yes, it was really difficult on the conditions today, and you know the the Wildcat used to kind of sit up high there, and with the position of the GoPro camera, it was really hard to you know sitting that close to the panel to see everything. Okay, looking at my airspeed indicator, pretty trimmed out. Looks like I'm doing about 200, at least on almost 200 knots indicated. you can see the gun sight there. If it was turned on, there'd be like a little pattern there that you could see, uh, you know, for a line on the, uh, an airplane if you were going after it or whatever you were trying to shoot at. The front windscreen, uh, the angled one there, is actually bulletproof. The side ones are just plexiglass. And I'm still cruising around with my canopy open. You can see it on the shadow out there. Oh, we're going to do a roll here. Either that or I hit a little bit of turbulence. Yeah, I'll probably set up here at some point to maybe do a little bit of a 4.12. Checking around for traffic, making sure nobody's around. Diving down a little bit, pulling the nose up, get it up a little bit. And yeah, we'll stop at 90 degrees. Stop. Roll to inverted, and I'm still positive in the seat right there because I'm actually continuing to pull the nose through. So I, I might get a little light in my seat, but uh, you know, there's really not a place up there to put a glass of tea for me to pour like Bob Hoover, but uh, I could do it if I had to. And you see there's a little bit of a cushion on the back of the gun sight there in case you, you know, make a very quick landing. I've got a little friend who lives on an airstrip not too far away, so let's go see what they're up to. Of course, I'm coming in, and uh, I think I'm going to go. I'm a little, a little too fast for landing, so I'm going to make a go around. That's what you call a bulk landing. Lots of swamp around where we're at. And see if flight's going to be up and to the right. There we go. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'll we'll probably come in and do kind of what my normal airplane of the day pattern was. I come in and, you know, show people the top of the airplane, the bottom of the airplane and stuff. There's nobody there today. Picking up a little speed. Going down runway 22. Back, show the top of the airplane. That's what people call an airshow pass. There's a constellation with the B-25 sitting outside. Pulling up, checking, rolling around. There's our famous DC-3 icon. G. Willie is waving. I don't know if you can see him down there. There's our reader board. I think I just saw they were promoting Naked in Jamaica rum. Naked in Jamaica. My sight was okay. Coming back around, and we're going to set up for showing the belly of the airplane. So we're going to roll to the left, show the belly. Nice little shadow there. Yeah, I actually acquired this airplane from uh, Alexis DuPont. He was up in uh, Pennsylvania. He had two Wildcats. This was a project. And we originally, uh, you know, started uh, working on it. He was going to finish the airplane out. And it kept, the time kept going longer and longer and longer. And the value of the airplane kept going up. I said, you know something, Lex? I'll take it now. I'll finish it myself. Because I was afraid he was going to renege on the deal. But anyway, it's been a great airplane. So we finished it ourselves. And I think we got Grand Champ Warbird at Center Fund the first year we took it there. Coming down the short runway here, and just basically we're going to kind of cross it at an angle, just to kind of show the airplane level coming by. It's got a great sound to it. It's just such a fun little flying airplane. And we bank around, and I think this will probably be my could be my last pass here. And as you know, the wings fold on the FM2 here. This is actually a General Motors built uh, Wildcat, so it's an FM2. The original one, the Grumman built, was an F4F. Uh, but they got wrapped up with a Hellcat production, the F6, and delegated the continuation of the Wildcat to General Motors. Yeah. And pull up here. Okay, getting ready to land. First thing we do is turn on the boost pump. And then we put the mixture full rich, bring the throttle back, start slowing down. And open the canopy. And I actually have to push it back with my elbow there, and my arm. And there's a frequency. If you get it in one place, you, it gets a flutter going and it starts buzzing. I've got to push it back really quickly. So there I go. So I push the little lever back. Now I'm cranking the gear down. And ultimately, I'm looking for this little tab, red tab, that's going to come out just in front of where I'm cranking. It's going to say down, about 32 cranks. Should be coming up here. There we go. See, it popped out right there. That's what we're looking for. So we're all ready on the landing gear. we got flaps to go. And, of course, I can drop the flaps out at any speed. There's no red line on the flaps. So there I'm flopping that, and the indicator is out on the wing there. There's one on each side. So at the speed I'm at, that's as far as they want to come out, even though it's full down. And as I slow down, the flaps will come out on their own. Coming down a little bit more. Yeah, up to the left there, there's a big uh, cell tower that I always want to make sure that I miss. It's about 400 feet high, but I'm usually not a problem. Flaps are coming down. I'm pretty much almost down now, so I think I've come in over the fence about 90, 90 knots or something like that. There's the tower, and I feel like a Reno racer. <laughs> and coming in, uh, lining up, you can see runway four at Fantasy of Flight coming into view, just on the other side of Interstate 4 there. All the runways at Fantasy of Flight are grass because a lot of the early airplanes we fly didn't have any brakes like the World War I airplanes. There we go, pushing the prop full forward. And 
I'm just going to slow it down to make a nice three-point landing. Come about 100 feet right there. I can't really see my airspeed, but slowing it down, I'm just going to keep the stick back, hold it off the ground until basically you just you try and stall it and hit the ground at the same time. There we go. And at some point I'll be opening up the cow flaps here. Yep. Here comes the cow flaps opening up. Now if I would have had it gone around, I would just would have used climb power. Now I'm gonna raise the flaps. So I just move that little lever. And you see how slow they operate, but it's just like I said, it's negative pressure. It runs off of a vacuum. And just unlock the tail wheel. I basically just explain I've got an S turn to see where I'm going, so I make a little bit of a right turn to see to the left vice versa over to the left to see the right. Okay, turning the boost pump off. And I'm checking my watch here to see how long I flew. It's about 15 minutes, so, you know, taxiing around, we'll call it uh, three tenths. I always log my stuff in tenths, so I'd write that down as three tenths by the time I got back to the ramp. Mixture back to auto lean. Yeah, normally you might want to open the cow flaps coming in on short final, but uh, the runway was clear and I had a lot of, there was nobody around. It wasn't a problem, so I just left them, left them closed till I landed and opened them, you know, so we know we're cool too quickly. You can see how you're really moving your head around to make sure you're not gonna hit anything. It's a little distracting watching. Shutting the engine off with the uh, mixture, going back to idle cutoff. There goes the RPM, going to zero. Okay, so we're all shut off, and uh, so we got the mags off, master switch off, and the fuels off. So it's always mags, master fuel. And everything else looks pretty good. I'll readjust the trim for the next flight. I didn't touch the aileron or the rudder. And uh, it's idle cutoff. Boost pumps off. Mags are off. Everything's set. Uh, that was a good flight. It was fun. Thanks for coming along. Pretty cool, huh? Life is good.